Before we wait, I just really want to say big thanks to Vertical Crypto, to Tesla's Foundation, and to everyone that flew in here today from all across the world. So, round of applause to all of you for making it. I see some familiar faces. Some people, some people go straight from New York to London. That's amazing. Uh, I know that Zan Ken had to actually travel 200 miles on a cab on his journey here. So that's really impressive. <laughs> Congratulations on that. So, so I think yeah, we'll, we'll just slowly kickstart and we'll share the mic for the first questions. So um, again. Thank you to all the panelists for being here today and the opportunity and the platform to talk about the beautiful world of generative art. I think the first question, um, we will go with a round of introductions. Um, I'm sure many people here already know the speakers, but for those of you that don't, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about yourself and how you got to work with generative art, and I'll just go um, in the round. So if Michael, you want to go first. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so... Um I have become a generative artist like a year ago only, and it's been such an adventure. Uh, but uh, I've been a programmer for a very long time, since I was a kid actually. Uh, but uh, I wasn't considering it like art until NFTs. Uh, before that, I've been a painter working in oils. So I was more like on the traditional side of uh, art making and it totally changed uh, a year ago, as I said. And I'm known in the space for uh, working with uh, natural elements, rendering grass and trees and stuff like that. Thank you. Um, Cypher, do you want to go next? Hey, everyone. Um, so I started developing very young as well, not into generative art doing video games and websites, and at some point discovered generative art. That, and I, I had a nice transition from developing video games which are like uh, environments and the uh, universe in themselves, and uh, it was a nice transition, and I uh, enjoyed the practice of generative art, like making an environment for itself with its own rules. Kinda got addicted to that. And uh, I, yeah, that was my introduction to generative art. Uh, hi, my name is Anna, Anna Lucia, generative artist. Um, I made my first processing sketch about three and a half years ago, and that's also how I learned how to program. Uh, I didn't do any programming before that, completely self-taught. Um, and at the moment that I discovered processing, something just immediately clicked for me. I think I feel very comfortable in a space where kind of logic and creativity collide, and I think that's what makes generative art so compelling for me, because these two things um, come together. Um, and since I discovered processing, I haven't stopped since. Um, uh, I always, yeah, making something. Um, mostly it's very... Um, geometric and abstract and bold colors. Um, hi, my name is Iskra Vlichkova. I My background is in data visualization. I worked there for a um, long time, first with my own studio, then in a big corporation. And actually, I, after many years dealing with data, I just decided that my big interest was more focused on the algorithms itself. and you know, all the questions behind the algorithms, how we are shaping society with these technologies, how we are changing the way we interact with each other. And those were very, um, let's say, philosophical questions to, to get through in a huge company. So I quit my job and, and I focused on art, and, which is actually, generative art is the same as data visualization, but just um, with more freedom, let's say, and, and only focusing on the beauty itself, not the, um, the results. So here I am. Thank you. Okay, hello, everyone. My name is Marcelo Soria Rodriguez, and um, I am an engineer by training, a failed architect by heart, a, a jack of all trades, wannabe, more or less. Uh, so I have a, a, range, a range of interests uh, that took me in my, in my corporate career to do like a little bit of a weird approach to my uh, work as a first a developer, then a team manager, and then the end, like a strategy manager, something like that, in technology. And uh, also, uh, I was trying to look at uh, 
uh, questions uh, between machines and humans and machines and society and what about uh, advanced AIs and what all what is all that going to mean when it comes um, to us uh, I always had a strong desire to do something a little bit more creative I was doing photography music and other things and uh, yeah I had been like toying around with uh, code for some years but like very little things but for this uh, last year and a half two years I've been now delving deeply into generative art and uh, here I am. Thank you for the introductions. Um, so we have little time, many questions to unpack. Just to read the room, how many people here, can you raise your hand if you collected the work by one of the artists on the stage? All right, all right, we got, we got a DGEN, well-educated audience, well done. Um, so one of the first questions, um, let's talk about the process. So we have many different backgrounds, engineering, music, um, traditional painting. How do you go about creating your work and um, what inspires you the most? And I think to kickstart, maybe Iskra, I will just go back to your introduction. Do you wanna go first? Thank you. <laughs> um, well, about my practice, it's all about in my case, it's, and I guess uh, same happens with many of you, it's about questions and that's about uh, when you are into art or into technology and innovation, it's everything about questions. And I really need to, I was um, working in a big company, I was uh, very lucky to work with uh, an incredible team of scientists there. And you know, science is about questions and, and I got so interested in that thing, learning about how um, machine learning techniques could find answers or distances between things, you know, and, and how that could help me to answer my own questions about myself, about my identity. Um, What's the distance between you and me? What's uh, similar, what's not, what, what is not? Um, why nature is so perfect? And these kind of questions, I think now we are in a very um, incredible moment that we are facing, that technology is just going so fast and we can um, use it to, to get deep into these questions. So that's my process. I'm, I'm not a formal coder. Um, everything I learned by myself and I'm always like behind technology. I want to do something and I, I try to find the best way to do it and learn uh, by doing, let's say. So my process is just like um, getting like freedom to the code, destroying the code and then uh, dealing with um, things that I didn't expect to find in the code. And then I have this dialogue, I'll, I'll try to have this dialogue with the machine, and, and I try to deal with uh, all the things that I don't understand, actually. Thank you for that. Marcelo, would you like to add, sorry, from your background? Yeah, well, my, my process is mostly based on um, both in my career as an artist and also in my years as a corporate thing. Um, I was like trying to find the, the limits of the system that I was working with, trying to expand it, uh, saying, well, if we were, I was in banking, so what is a bank and what could be a bank if we expand the frontiers? So that's kind of what I like to do also with, uh, with generative systems and it's most important I like the question of can I can I uh, create emotions in the experimenter of the artwork? Uh, can can I through a machine? Can I collaborate with a machine to create human emotions? And going forward, can I um, potentially create something that at some point will make a machine has have its own versions of whatever emotions could be for a machine? So that's kind of a, a something that that really uh, inspires me very much because uh, I am very much moved by the works of art that I like, and uh, and that. that that makes me wonder, uh, well, if, if that moves me so deeply, what, what does that mean to me? What does that mean to other humans? And what would that ever mean for a machine, if at all? So I don't know if I replied, but... Of, of course, yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you for your response. Um, and I think we can unpack the same sort of question building upon our second question, because um, both Cypher and Michael, you have more familiarity with codes and I wanted to just throw in like how has the advent of blockchain and the possibilities the long form opened up affect your practice and what you were doing and sort of like offer new forms of collection. Um, maybe Cypher, do you want to start? Yeah. Um 
two years ago, I think, I tried, so I was already doing generative art in my room, basically, on my screen, and I thought to myself, I'd like to do this sort of full time, try to be an artist and have freedom and, uh, you know, the, the dream <laughs> of living out of your art. Um, but it was very difficult. Um, I knew nobody, no, had no contacts, and I had to like go outside, uh, talk to associations, go to some meetings, try to talk to some people, to eventually get some contacts, to eventually get into some festivals, which is not ideal. And it's a lot of work. And also um, putting a physical installation is, again, a lot of work. It can take months to get something ready. and. Eventually, you're not getting really paid by doing that. So you're wasting, not wasting, but you're spending a lot of time to get to a point where uh, you enjoy what you do, but you can't live out of it. So you need something else. And at some point, like I heard about blockchains uh, quite late, not blockchains, but NFTs uh, quite late, and decided, okay, I need to try this. And I think lots of us went through this, and it was like a breakthrough in how we can use our artistic work to simply live, first of all, which gives us more freedom to create, which gives us more freedom to experiment. I, I recall my first drop on Niketnunk. It was uh, all the community suddenly about my pieces, and I was like, what's happening to me? Like, uh, this is 1,000 euros. It's amazing. It's a lot of money. And uh, for my art, you know, it was very um, intriguing and uh, interesting and liberating. Yeah, thanks for that. And you sort of like through that path, you also opened a platform like for pretty much everyone on the stage to then release their work through FX Hash and sort of like maybe Michael, do you want to share your journey um, into this space? Like you mentioned last year was one of the like key points, turning points in your career. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, before uh, doing generative art, I didn't have an artistic career actually. I've been a painter, as I said. But uh, I was doing painting uh, in addition to a day job. And uh, painting was uh, taking a lot of time, like I needed uh, half a year or one year to make a single painting. It wasn't sustainable, uh, especially when you uh, grow a family and build a house yourself. So, um, uh, well, it, it had been five years six years without painting when I uh, felt that I needed to, get, to go back to create. It was, when I say a need, it was really important in my life at that point. And I tried to get back to drawing, but it wasn't the same. I lacked uh, an intent, actually. And then I heard about NFTs, and I, I thought that, yeah, I could create with uh, what I know I can do fairly well, uh, programming. So uh, I started to uh, do uh, art with code, and I went directly uh, into my former inspirations, like nature. And uh, also, uh, I was working a lot of with uh, symbolism in uh, figurative works with painting, and I just kept on with those kind of topics, but in a different medium. So uh, I started to develop works that were entirely made of code, but representing something like plants and trees, and, um, but also with a twist and a meaning behind. And it's important to say that uh, at this point, because uh, I had the feeling that everything generative was mostly abstract, and it was difficult to find uh, what was the intent uh, in terms of, um, I don't know, personal meaning or uh, what part of the artist was really there in the work. So uh, this is where I thought I could bring something different with uh, generative art. And then, yeah, I made a few um, drawings that were um, curated. Like, you generate various outputs based on a random seed, and you chose, you cherry pick the, um, the 
one you prefer and release it as a NFT, but then came FXH and uh, what FXH can do uh, is like you provide the code and it can generate like hundreds of uh, different outputs and it, it's, it really changed the way I was creating that. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's amazing. Okay. And it's also like, I feel like a lot is lost in translation. So when you look at the work, um, it's often hard to communicate that story. Um, and it's really good that we're talking about these things today as well. And just building upon, like you mentioned, you know, FX Hash offered to release hundreds of work, but they're all relatively unique. I just wanted to pick up on a point that maybe like often collectors ask, um, and I wonder if they ask you that, and how do you feel about it in terms of oversupply? Uh, because it's really easy to fall into experimentation and just minting new collections. And maybe Anna, you could speak like in the context of your practice, like how do you th go about thinking and planning um, your releases? Yeah, I think what the NFT space has done for us as artists, which is so empowering, is that now from the comfort of our home, there is suddenly a marketplace that we can go to. And like the story that you just told with like the meetings and everything you have to go through to maybe be shown on a festival um, has all disappeared. You know, I can go to FX Hash this afternoon, I'm into collection if I want, and nobody is there to, nobody there to negotiate that with, but that with that kind of power for ourselves then also comes the responsibility of uh, not oversupplying. I think the question of oversupply, I think as an artist you can't make too much work. Um, I, I think that's a silly thing to say. I think as an artist if you, we, you have a need to make something and you, you make it, uh, and I think for all of us it's sure through that our computers might be littered with sketches everywhere. Um, the question comes like, when do you when do you bring that to the marketplace, which is hard. And for me, personally, I make a lot of work and I even also share a lot of that online, but uh, I, I don't feel the need to make all of that an NFT because I think you need to be very generous with your work and share it, but you don't necessarily need to need to sell it all in a way and that's something that's possible as a digital artist as well you don't have to turn all your work into an nft so i'm quite conservative i work with small small collections um yeah i don't know if other people have another way of dealing that but yeah i have to say that i don't know <laughs> i think um i think there is um always a story around everything. So there is a story about uh, an open edition. There is a story around one of one, something that I really like to do. I just know that one would be a one of one because it's something that I really want to express by one. And then there are other ones, um, for example, in FX Hash, my collection, I, I needed to do that in a long form um, expression because it, for me, needed to have more editions. But, um, I think we are here in this panel and in all the event to discuss many things and this is a very important thing for me. Uh, when we talk about uh, oversupply, su supply, sorry, um, is in terms of how we understood the art so far. I mean, um, you can do a lot of work and then if you are very prolific like Picasso, you, you release many, many things now, but when you talk about a system that it's infinite in terms of outputs, um, that's a versal supply. I'm, I really, the, 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 that word, it's not for me. But I mean, um, what is this? Because if I sell the system and you run it, it's like, uh, so there is something that we really need to really understand. What, what, what's the work, actually? Not the output or a system. And once we understand that, all, or we consent uh, this is the, the artwork, then it would change our perspective about um, that word that I cannot say. And so uh, this is... Yeah, I would just add, um, building on that, that actually oversupply only exists if you consider the market. And, and we tend to, with all this NFT thing, we tend to blend uh, in an intimate fusion unit uh, the art and the market, but they are different. 
the art is still the art and the market is very necessary for us to, to be independent, like we were saying and everything, uh, but they're two different things. So, so art cannot be oversupplied ever because there is, there is as long as an artist has a, a will to express something, uh, then, then why not? I mean, the, who, is, who is to say, no, you, you're producing too much art, you know? I mean, please stop. No, well, they just look elsewhere. Uh, however, I can understand that there would be uh, maybe a worry from the market perspective around, oh, there's so much of your work that maybe it's not so, so valued anymore. Well, um, could be, and then that, that, that might be a conversation, but again, this is where I would connect it with this cross point about our notion of what oversupply is comes from a previous world where, where it was impossible to produce an actual, I mean, uh, oversupply had a different meaning. But, uh, but if I make a, a generative system and I leave it completely open forever, then okay, maybe that has no value at all for someone who buys it uh, thinking in terms of, oh, I wanna resell in, in some time, but maybe it has a very high value in terms of what the artwork tries to express or the impact that it may have on, the, on, the, or, or on an audience, for example. So, you know, it's, it's food for thought. Yeah, many, many really good points and suggestions also for, for new artists because I can imagine there could be a struggle determining what, what is the right balance. And I know, um, Michael, you recently made a piece that's also connected to, um, to supply but also to this idea of having control because I think something that changed, especially like how we meant long from generative art is before artists would select works that go for sale, but now once the work is minted, there's an element of chance um, could you maybe talk about a little bit more about like the live minting events and some of your recent collections? Yeah, um, well, you're referring to a, a bugged forest, maybe, the last project that I've made, which is about yeah, releasing control because, um, well, um, with generative art uh, itself, you prepare a system, a program that is able to generate a number of, of uh, randomized outputs. So you need to, as an artist, to be extremely in control of your code so that the random numbers that are going to be picked and define what the output is going to look like, you, you need some control about the limits of the system so that the output is still valid, whatever the number that is picked as a seed, the output still must look good. Um, so even though you introduce chance in your creative process, you have to put a lot of control on your system. And uh, well, it was the same with traditional drawing and even more, I think, uh, by making a painting, you have to go through an infinity of very small decisions, but each time you make a choice and you have to be in control all the time. So uh, in my last project, well, I went a bit freestyle about it, I think, because um, I actually started from a bug, which happened while I was programming something with an ID in mind and it produced a completely different result than what I was expecting with um, visuals that I would never have thought of or even that I would, I would never have allowed myself to release such a graphic result. But uh, I made the choice to accept that uh, that it was uh, graphically valid and uh, that was a gift actually from chance to be able to, 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 to get a, a result that is not what was your intent but it's still good and I made a generative art project out of this bug which is made of a thousand pieces not of them have been minted yet because uh, I don't know, some wallets do, don't know uh, that they are on the reserve list, I guess. Not so many, like eight are remaining, I think. So uh, go check. <laughs> Please go <laughs> check if your go wallets check. are qualified for well, the ones, yeah. But it's, um, uh, yes, it's uh, the idea of releasing control and uh, it made me feel more uh, free 
as an artist to be able to uh, just rely on um, on randomness and chance to uh, to make this uh, bugged forest with outputs that are sometimes very surprising, sometimes uh, very minimalistic, but still uh, they make a role that has personality, I think, and you can make a parallel with uh, real persons and real personalities. Yeah, the, yeah. the influence of chance. Yeah. And um, thank you for that. And I, I think I want to bring up the point that Cypher, you, you sort of balance the two worlds where you have to have full control of the platform and make sure everything works perfectly. But at the same time, you're also working on your art. And maybe how do you find balance in that? Like, how, how do you, um, can you talk to it? It's gone. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> the balance is gone. Um, <laughs> since I started the uh, FX, uh, I had like one week. Uh, putting day, day by day, like a uh, whole week of uh, art, and that's it. Uh, I have no more time to do it. And it's uh, a bit depressing when thinking about it, but you know, it's, it's, just, it's the drill. <laughs> you, uh, um, I have other exciting stuff to do, and um, it's a whole uh, experience, and uh, a whole travel that we are, we are, the tools that we are trying to build, these are some tools that I'd like to use right now. And I hope that uh, some other artists will benefit from all of these tools. And I hope at some point I will have the time to work a little bit more on my art because, uh, frankly, it's missing. But uh, I feel like I have sort of a responsibility you now that artists are using the platform, that it needs to be maintained properly, and we need to head in the right direction for the whole community. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, Anna, do you also find it challenging to balance like your day job and your artist career, or has that also gone out of the window? I think from speaking to many of the artists, I feel like I'm the one that has it most down. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm naturally quite a relaxed person. Um, if I don't want to do something, I generally just don't do it. Um, I've quit my day job, for example, didn't want to do that anymore. Very good decision. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I focus a lot on um, like my own mental health. Like I just went five days on a canoe trip in the middle of the forest with no internet connection, uh, just sitting by a bonfire and moving all day. And it's just been such a gift. And it's so, so important to do those things. Also, if you're not an artist, just in generally get out into nature a lot. Um, that's, that's what I do. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think it's also sometimes we just forget um, how quickly the space moves and how much pressure there is, but to take breaks. And I, I love that we saw each other and then you, know, you just disappear to relax. That was wonderful. Um, I just, I think we're, um, we're slowly running out of time. So I have one more question and then maybe we have time for, uh, for audience questions. But we were talking earlier about the idea of sort of like, where is the space moving forward and um, how do we onboard more people into the space? and Maybe like Marcelo, uh, do you want to talk a bit more about like there are certain practices that are taking place, like live minting events or the combination of traditional uh, institutions exhibiting uh, generative arts? Um, what do you think is sort of like does this help the ecosystem? Um, what do you think would be some of the ways to improve it moving forward? Um, mm hmm. Well, I don't know. Uh, the truth is, I, I do believe that we need to broaden the range of uh, different experiences to try to reach more people. Not because we have to, well, just, just because making this available to more people. We, I mean, I believe, I think we all believe in the, in the beauty of uh, generative art and, and the potential change that it means for certain things. And, um, and trying to bring this closer to more people is, uh, in our opinion, good, of course. Uh, now, all the minting thing that happens on the blockchain and so on is what allows us to have this new market that makes uh, certain things thrive. But a lot of people are like way out there, very far away from this uh, from this reality, and uh, and they've got no idea how to go there. And uh, and when you go to people who are absolutely away from from technology, then this is a no go, absolutely. So uh, creating new experiences where you build, where you bring first of all just 
generative art, not even the market of generative art, but just generative art to people, finding new ways to exhibit it, finding new ways to um, explain what generative art is, to explain uh, this, this issue of what is the artwork that Iskra was mentioning, is it one mint, is it the thousand artworks that, that are officially minted, is it the potential for, for the algorithm to run eternally, uh, producing new artworks continuously, that, those are questions that absolutely change the landscape, uh, the art landscape uh, for, for those who are not on this thing. So um, just creating things that uh, bring those concepts closer to the people and letting them actually maybe play with them, letting them experience them uh, in first in their, yeah, in first person. I think that that's good. Then live minting experiences is one of uh, those ways to bring that closer to an audience. Um, but, but I'm pretty sure that there are still many, many, many uh, bridges that we can build and many new experiences that uh, can be thought about. Yeah, um, I agree on that. Uh, you put it in a nice way. And as you mentioned, live minting experience is one of the ways that we can bring this generative art in a new way to the people. And to bounce off of maybe my personal experience and some of your personal experiences, before we had um, NFT space, it was art to exhibit our art and it was art to get recognized. And we want to provide tools to facilitate that, but tools as a framework like facilitate, uh, I don't know, the access to screens, the access to spaces, um, bring new tools to artists so that they can experiment, for instance, the ability to add controllers so that they can, visitors can trick the parametric space between minting, this kind of, all these sort of tools that can maybe change the way people interact with art and change the way people perceive generative art because it's such a wide and amazing field. Uh, we can't just display this on screen. There's so much more that we can do and we'll try to provide this hopefully properly <laughs> to the space. Yeah, if I may add just something very short, building on what you said, um, which I also agree with, it's that it's not just that we need to build bridges with the existing, um, 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 what's the word, with the existing uh, way of uh, exhibiting and experiencing art. It's about maybe destroying that and creating a new way. Uh, or not destroying, but you know, we, we don't need to be limited by, by the white box. We don't need to be limited by the uh, existing exhibition spaces. We don't need to be limited by that because art, is, since it is now digitized or it, it is born in a digital format, it can do other things. It doesn't need to be bound by the physical uh, limitations we had and at the same time time, I am one that wants to bring also art to those limitations because first of all those limitations help you do maybe something more um, um, uh, worked, uh, a little bit more refined, but at the same time some of those experiences were like they were because they also helped elevate the art and elevate also the experiencer, which is a very important thing. I mean, uh, we have to help people experience art and, and we have to let people be touched by art and maybe sometimes, I mean, uh, look Looking at generative collections here is not the best way. It's not going to elevate me in the same way as I can be elevated if I experience it in a different way. How? I don't know. I do think I, um, I live in Egypt and in uh, Egypt you don't have access to all these beautiful white boxes like you have in London or many other places in the world where you have access to these beautiful museums and, and at events like this and there's just culture everywhere around you. Um, so therefore I like to experiment with how can you actually make art for a mobile phone or for a computer screen because it makes it so much accessible for anybody who has a mobile phone and an internet connection which is you know a lot more people in the world than you think um, so that's why it is something that I I like to play with as well uh, as much as I like to be exhibit here and experiment with that um, but creating accessibility and I think digital art has a power to to do that actually I just wanted to add a, a very uh, sure thing, building app on, on when you mentioned before. I don't know where we're going, but it's for sure somewhere that goes through a dialogue between the platforms and the artists. Because I think we, um, as artists, we are asking for new ways to release our work, but also platforms with their decisions 
they shape the way we understand our own work. I mean, if, if I have a platform that allows me to mint 1,000 works, then my work is a 1,000 output work because they allowed me to do that. So that decision uh, shapes the way we project um, our next question or next need, you know, and we build from there. So um, it's a very important thing, I think, that dialogue, the channels to, to make it possible, it's something really important. And then I, I think it's something new, that uh, thing that we can reach, you know, people that build the platforms and, and have this uh, conversation. Yeah, I think it's it's almost um, because in the traditional art world you have sort of like the artist's trajectory of how an artist's career path is growing and traditional institutions play a very large part at establishing um, the reputation of the artists and the market for the artists. And I think that's something really new, even though generative art has existed, it's one of the earliest forms of digital art, but it's still relatively new to establish what are sort of like the career um, paths for the artists who are the influential figures. And also like in the NFT space, often even influencers play a gatekeeping role or the platforms themselves. And I think this is really what excited us all about like FX hash, that there was this almost like open entry uh, accessibility for everyone to enter, both because um, there was no curation anyone can publish, um, depending on their technical skills, but also because of the price points. Like many of the works were um, and still are quite affordable. I think we have five minutes left. I have a question, but just in case, yeah, we have an audience question, so would you like to go first? <laughs> Thank you, my name is Alex, I do technology art and money. Uh, my question is because we were talking about bridges early on. How artists see themselves past money, past exchange, past sell? Because the moment uh, the NFT give that bridge to, like it does financial inclusion of around the, you know, everyone who formed himself as an artist to money, bypassing uh, traditional institutions, auction houses, etc. But also NFT is going to allow us to move past payment, past money, past glorified exchange for money. How artists see themselves there? So how, how do artists see themselves past monetary exchange? Yes, because the moment they, that we hear today that most people can, yeah, we're allowed to quit our jobs and do that without money. But I see that NFT is going to allow us to replace uh, simple money, which are any currencies today, uh, to some uh, more complex sustainability, uh, human sustainability method, which uh, does not need money, does not need glorified, glorified exchange, my time for some pounds, pennies, and etc. And how then artists see themselves uh, in that, that period, how they see this NFT enable that bridge which you talk about. Thank you. Oh, would anyone like to go first? Oh, yeah, uh, well, I think the art stays. Uh, for me, for instance, before NFTs, I wasn't doing any digital art. And I found in NFT and in generative art a new way of creating. And I could uh, actually stop my dead job and become an artist, which I felt that I had never been. Uh, not enough to uh, be just that, an artist. So, um, NFTs for one year, they allowed me to uh, create a new body of work and develop a practice and uh, develop also uh, a, a network of uh, great collectors and uh, transmissions of, uh, transmission of feelings toward uh, not just art, but also uh, things that surround ourselves, like uh, nature. Uh, well, this is, for me, a great achievement already. And, well, I think uh, it's something that is there, that is going to continue to be there, even though there is no marketplace anymore. Well, um, I, I'm very satisfied with the way it is now, and whatever it is going to be next. I have done that, artworks, and I'm very pleased with that. Thank you. Um, you can find all the speakers after the panel. I think we ran out of time, but thanks everyone. Uh, thank you for the panel. Thank you.